has uh, worked on uh, types in many different types of systems, from white dwarfs to uh, triple system to binaries. Today is going to talk about talent synchronization and heating in compact white dwarf binaries. Yeah, thank you, Francois. It's, uh, it's good to be here. I see you. This is my first time here. It's a beautiful sunny day in January in Toronto. Actually, there was some sun, so it couldn't be all bad. Um, yeah, I'm going to be trying to squeeze in kind of the bulk of my thesis research into about half an hour, 40 minutes right here. Uh, so I'm going to go fast, uh, boss over a couple things, but hopefully we'll learn about uh, the major aspects of this problem of tides and white dwarf binaries. Um, so the scenario that, that we're looking at here is you have a very short period binary white dwarf system, say orbital period of something like an hour. Uh, the internet doesn't work. <laughs> so what you would see here is a video of two white dwarfs in spiraling. Their orbit decays due to the emission of gravitational waves. Um, and as the orbit decays, of course, the white dwarfs become closer and closer to one another. Tidal effects become more and more important. And uh, we want to know, are, you know, is that tidal effect strong enough to keep up with the orbital decay? So are the white dwarfs able to synchronize with each other before they merge? Uh, how is this going to affect gravitational wave forms or next generation uh, gravitational wave detectors? Is it going to significantly heat the white dwarfs, maybe change their internal structure, maybe give you an observational precursor to the merger? Uh, of course, there's implications for type 1a supernovae, so there's lots of interesting stuff going on here. Uh, and these are kind of the, the questions that I'm going to at least try to start to answer. is gravity waves. Now these are different from gravitational waves. These are buoyancy waves that propagate within the stably stratified region of a star. So for instance, in a high mass main sequence star, uh, the gravity waves will propagate in the stably stratified envelope of the star. And in a solar mass star, gravity waves will propagate uh, in the core of the star. Uh, and they're launched typically due to tides. They're launched from this convective radiative interface. Uh, in a white dwarf, there's not really any thick convection zone. There's a little thin surface convection zone. There's not a big one that, that's good at launching gravity waves. So one of the questions is, how do you ex actually excite gravity waves within a white dwarf? Uh, now to remind you, the bulk of a white dwarf is this big degenerate uh, carbon oxygen core. For a low mass white dwarf, it's a helium core. Uh, that makes up almost all the mass of the white dwarf, but typically it's surrounded by a thin helium shell, which in turn is surrounded by a thin hydrogen atmosphere. Uh, now the, the property of the star that really dictates the behavior of the gravity waves is the brute by solid frequency. That tells you how buoyant uh, the, the material of the star is. And uh, it's positive in stably stratified regions, which is almost the entirety of the white dwarf. Uh, and it also has these spikes here at the composition gradients when you go from the core to the helium layer to the hydrogen layer. You get these spikes in brute by solid frequency. And one of the things that I found is that those spikes uh, are what's going to give the tidal potential something to grip onto and uh, allow you to actually excite gravity waves, which can then induce tidal dissipation within the star. So in our first crack at the problem, we thought about uh, the excitation of discrete gravity modes. So you can have the, stole, the whole star oscillate coherently uh, in a global oscillation mode. And so what we did is we calculated those oscillation modes as the orbit decays through a resonance of one of those modes. We calculated the amplitude of the mode after that resonance. And what we found is that that amplitude generated physical displacements associated with the modes. So this is a, 
a radial displacement is the, is the dashed line, and a horizontal displacement is the solid line here. Uh, these are two different modes. Uh, for both these calculations, you can see that the physical displacement associated with the mode, according to this calculation, is something like 10 or 100 times the radius of the star. Uh, which is completely unphysical. It means that these, these modes become very nonlinear in the outer layers of your star. In particular, once they become, once the, once the displacement becomes larger than the wavelength, which is basically the inverse of the wave number, uh, that's, that's about when the, when the waves are going to become nonlinear and actually overturn on themselves and break. So was this WKB or that was global? I so this is, this is a global mode. Yeah, so no WKB approximation is used to calculate those. Uh, so, just like an ocean wave approaching the shore, um, we think that these gravity waves will propagate into the outer layers of the white dwarf and break there and locally deposit almost all of their energy and angular momentum. And then they won't reflect and come back. So, instead of having global standing modes, you'll have traveling, propagating gravity waves within your star. So the basic picture of how these gravity waves uh, propagate throughout the star is that you have basically the bulk of your star, the core of the star, is this big region with a small root by solid frequency where gravity waves propagate in both directions. And it's, it's basically like having a standing wave right there. There's no net angular momentum transport. But then there's a sudden change in root by solid frequency at one of those composition gradients. And above that region, you have just an outgoing wave. So some of this, some of this energy leaks out and uh, transports energy and angular momentum to the outer layers of the white dwarf. So uh, here's some examples of some of the numerical calculations we do to, to prove this point. Uh, this is uh, some calculations of the physical displacements that you get. Um, these are. So to do this, we calculate the, the displacements from the perturbation equations using an outgoing wave out of boundary condition uh, and including a tidal forcing frequent, a tidal forcing term, of course, to excite the waves. And so what that does is it allows you to, gives you waves that go out, you know, up into the surface of your star where, you know, um, we assume that they break somewhere and that's, that's an assumption that we make, we go back and check. And so this plot shows you actually the, the horizontal displacement associated with one of those calculations. It's very small in the bulk of the white dwarf, uh, but becomes very large here in the outer layers. And you can also see that the wavelength shrinks and becomes smaller. So that's going to promote uh, nonlinear wave breaking. You can also see that there's a real and imaginary part in the core, they're in phase, so that means there's no net angular momentum transports. Uh, but at this spike in room by solid frequency, you get a change in the character of the wave and it becomes a traveling wave. And so you can see that there's this phase offset. Uh, and in the top panel, this is basically a dimensionless angular momentum flux carried by the wave. It's basically zero in the core, and then right at that jump in room by solid frequency, it becomes positive and roughly constant. What's being done in terms of directly simulating a green white dwarf with uh, hydrocarbon? Uh, as far as I know, nothing. Because this would be done in a couple of poor clocks with another context. So right. It would be possible. Yeah, I would think it would be possible too. That would be great if somebody did it. I'd, I don't know if anybody's doing it though. Uh, the other reason it would be great is because, I'll talk about this in a bit, but there's some uncertainty into how, where the waves actually become nonlinear and break. And that's going to actually have important implications for how the white dwarf is heated. So I'll get to that. So it'd be great if somebody did a simulation. Okay, so this plot was, was for one tidal forcing frequency. So the tidal forcing frequency is basically just the difference between the orbital frequency of, of the two white dwarfs and the spin frequency. Um, we're assuming everything's still planar in the line. Uh, we're also assuming a circular orbit. Um, so what we did, uh, we want to know basically what's the tidal torque on a white dwarf at all forcing frequency. So what we did is we calculated that tidal torque as a function of uh, forcing frequency, little omega. Uh, everything's in dimensionless units here, so it's all in units of, 
of the mass of the white dwarf and, uh, and its radius. Uh, but basically, this is kind of the, the regime of frequencies that we'd expect to see in an spiraling system. And uh, this F, this is a dimensionless tidal torque. It's basically the inverse of a tidal cube. So if you like to parameterize tides in terms of a Q, which people do often do, they say there's just some constant tidal Q. Uh, you can see that's a pretty bad approximation for a white dwarf. Instead, we find that the tidal torque is this really highly oscillatory function of the forcing frequency. And also has a very strong dependence uh, in general on forcing frequency, it roughly scales of that forcing frequency to the sixth power. So there's a very strong dependence on the frequency. Uh, so naively, you'd, you'd think the title Q approximation would be very bad. I'm actually going to come back full circle and say it actually ends up being a fairly good approximation. If you know which title Q to choose, so we'll get to that. Okay, so once you know that title torque as a function of forcing frequency, you can basically just solve for the orbital evolution of the system. Uh, we know how the spin of the white dwarf is going to evolve, it's just going to spin up due to tides. So we're assuming a, a non-rotating white dwarf initially. Most white dwarfs rotate very slowly, especially compared to a short orbital period. So that should be a good approximation at long <coughs> orbital periods. Uh, and the orbital frequency is going to change due to two reasons. Uh, this is a, a tidal term right here, so this accounts for energy loss to tides, to waves within the stars. Uh, this term is the gravitational wave uh, term that accounts for the orbital behavior due to the emission of gravitational waves. Uh, it turns out this term is basically always going to be negligible. We can basically ignore it, so basically the orbit just decays due to gravitational waves. Uh, and then finally, if we know how both the spin frequency of the white dwarf and the orbital frequency change, we know how the tidal forcing frequency is going to change. Okay, and these are just T zeros, just these are the, the appropriate units of torque for the problem. It scales with, say, the, the mass of the perturber squared, the radius of the wave for fifth, to the fifth, that's another the power of omega to the fourth, if you work that out. Uh, and then this is just the gravitational wave in spiral time. So we can solve those equations. Oh, yeah. I didn't hear you about spin. I was wondering about spin and uh, the waves that you're describing are creating symmetric. Is that true? Uh, so that's a good question. Yeah, we're, we're basically just, um, <coughs> we're just using one component of the tidal potential. So the, the companion star is going to ex uh, exert basically tidal forces on your star. Uh, usually what people do is they expand that tidal potential uh, in spherical harmonics. Uh, and basically just one of those terms dominates. It's the L equals 2, M equals 2 spherical harmonic. And so basically we're calculating the tidal response due solely to that harmonic. But that, like I said, that term dominates. It should basically account for almost all the tidal dissipation. So yeah, so they're not, they're not radially symmetric, but they're uh, they're, they're basically oval shaped. Uh, anything else? Okay. So what, what I said earlier is that we found that, that torque on the white dwarf is pretty well approximated uh, in a general sense by a power law. It's proportional to the forcing frequency to some power n. Uh, and then there's some constant f that describes how strong that tidal torque is. Uh, and what you can do is you can basically set these two terms, sorry, you can set the spin, the increase in the spin frequency equal to the increase in the orbital frequency. Uh, and you can solve for, for an orbital frequency at which tides become very important. Um, like I said, this term is a very strong function of that orbital frequency. So tides are going to be very negligible when you're at large orbital separations, uh, but are going to become much more important as you move to smaller orbital periods. We want to know what's the orbital period at which tides become important. Uh, so you can solve for that by setting those two equations equal to each other. And uh, what we find is that critical orbital frequency at which tides become important is basically equal to uh, 
you can, these are basically just all constants of order unity. It's basically equal to the dynamical frequency of a white dwarf, which is on the order of a second, times this factor here. This is the Schwarzschild radius of a black hole of equal mass, divided by the, the radius of the white dwarf to the 5 halves power to basically the 1 over n power, or n about 5, which is what we find. So what that means is that because a white dwarf is much larger than a black hole, that this number is going to be very small. So the critical orbital frequency at which tides become important is of course going to be much less than the, the dynamical frequency of the white dwarf. If you put in all the appropriate numbers, it's going to work out to an orbital period of roughly an hour, depending on the white dwarf masses involved. Surely that force is very is just a nice playing around with numbers, because where yes. does the c squared come from? Yeah, so the reason that that's in there is because the orbital decay is caused by gravitational waves. I see. So in order to understand where tides become important, it depends on the strength of that orbital decay. So that's why you get this relativistic parameter. Um, and it turns out that above this orbital frequency, uh, you basically evolve to a state where the tidal frequency is almost exactly constant. So that means the spin frequency is basically just uh, the orbital frequency minus this small degree of asynchronization. Uh, this term is basically equal to one uh, right here. So you can basically just ignore this. So Initially, the white dwarf's not spinning at all, and then once you reach the critical orbital frequency, its spin frequency increases linearly with the orbital frequency. So by the time you merge, uh, the spin frequency is almost equal to the orbital frequency, just with a small degree of offset. Uh, so that means that by the time white dwarfs merge, we think that tides should have pretty efficiently synchronized them. They should be very close to synchronous rotation by the time they merge, which is something people didn't know before. Okay, so here's an example of that. We actually, this is an, an actual numerical integration of those equations using our, our full uh, tidal torque as a function of frequency. We start out the white dwarfs not spinning at all. What we plotted here is their spin frequency in units of the orbital frequency. They're not spinning at all. White dwarf, the tides aren't doing anything, but a, around this critical orbital period of about one hour, the white dwarfs start to become spun up. By the time mass transfer starts down here, somewhere around the orbital period of a few minutes, the white dwarfs are almost completely synchronized. Uh, and these different colors are just for different white dwarf models. And then this plot is actually for, for low mass helium core white dwarfs. Um, and at different temperatures, they have slightly different critical orbital periods, but it's about an hour. Before you go on, but yeah. I find that you sort of say as if this is all a given fact. So, <laughs> I mean, what is the theoretical uncertainty? I mean, you make some assumptions, especially yeah. in that leaking of the. Are you going to talk about that, or, or you know, is there any uncertainty? There's definitely some uncertainty. Uh, one of the things that's uncertain actually is how the white dwarfs evolve before before you reach kind of this traveling wave regime. So at long orbital periods, the, the waves won't be completely nonlinear, so you can actually get global oscillation modes. Uh, and you may actually be able to evolve into a state of resonance locking. So this is something Josh Burkhardt and Elliot Quadier have worked on. Uh, you may actually be able to get into a resonance locking state with one of those oscillation modes and be able to spin up the white dwarf a fair amount before we get into this regime I'm talking about. So you may actually be able to get some degree of, of synchronism at longer orbital periods, say orbital periods of a few hours. So that, that, that's something that we're not sure of that, may, that would certainly influence the subsequent uh, title of title. But is this is sort of a minimum state, it cannot be less than this? Or Probably, yeah, probably can't be much less than this because there could be other tidal dissipation mechanisms that we haven't taken into account. We're basically only considering one mechanism. There could be, uh, you know, uh, R modes or something like that. There could be some turbulent dissipation in the convective zone. If you cannot dissipate less than this. Yeah, this, this is probably a minimum. Could you dissipate less because if the gravitational waves, gravity waves, are, are 
if they break in surface, they deposit all the angle momentum there, and they will cause local differential rotation layers, and therefore they break even deeper. Would that change your? Calculus? Yes, that's that's a great question. Mostly so far, I've been assuming that the white dwarfs rotate as a rigid body. So as soon as some of the waves break and deposit their angular momentum, yes, that would set up some differential rotation, but I'm assuming that that angular momentum is then redistributed throughout the star on a, on a short time scale. If it's time? not, then then you, then you yeah, then it gets a bit See, tricky. We know here. from Novi, white dwarfs don't spin up if they accrete the matter, so apparently they're able to not put angular momentum through the star all that much. Sorry, Every well, but on a time scale of ten thousand years, they don't they don't do this. I don't know. That's At least they don't seem to. I mean, this is observationally it's sort of tricky. But we look at things which have been creeping for a while, and mm -hmm. they don't rotate very fast. Well, that could also be due to tidal feedback, right? You can put some of that angular momentum back into the orbit through tides. Instead of spinning up a white board. Well, the these are these are long enough. To Go ahead. Maybe uh, it would be interesting to see. Um, yeah. So I'll I'll talk a little bit about differential rotation in a minute. Uh, first, I want to say a little bit about tidal heating. Of course, the waves aren't just spinning up the white board. There's also tidal there's friction involved with that process. So you're going to deposit some heat within the white board. Um, now, some of the energy in the gravity waves is going to be used to actually put into rotational kinetic energy. So not all of it is going to be deposited as, as heat, just basically the remainder, um, basically some of the tidal energy goes into the kinetic energy, uh, the fraction that goes in as heat is basically one minus the spin frequency of the white dwarf divided by the orbital frequency. So if the white dwarf is completely synchronized, you won't get any energy deposited as heat. Uh, but if it's a little bit asynchronized, you'll get some heat. So that's important. Uh, and you can actually put in the equations from the previous slide to basically get a good approximation for how much tidal heat is put into the white dwarf uh, at short orbital periods. It basically goes as the moment of inertia of the white dwarf times the orbital frequency squared. Uh, divided by the gravitational wave decay time scale, and then times this parameter, that critical orbital frequency, divided by the orbital frequency to this power, which is about one, about the power of one. So it basically goes as a power law. Um, and because the white dwarf tends to evolve into the state where that tidal frequency is roughly constant, that means that the tidal Q approximation is actually pretty good. Remember I said tidal Q shouldn't work, but because that tidal forcing frequency isn't really changing, the system basically just settles into one configuration with one tidal Q. And that's uh, given roughly by the radius of the white dwarf divided by that Schwarzschild radius again, roughly to the bypass power. And that's been changed a bit with white dwarf model and stuff. But so this is a, a number of roughly 10 to the 7, 10 to the 8, something like that. That's roughly, we think, the tidal Q of a white dwarf in a, in a compact system whose orbit is decaying. But that's once it has started. To say that, yeah, so that's only a short orbital period. At long orbital periods, it's going to be something larger. Yeah. Okay, so here's a plot of, of the power uh, in heat power of heat deposited in the white dwarf as a function of the orbital period. I believe this plot is for a helium core 0.3 solar mass white dwarf with a companion of double that mass. Uh, you can see once you reach that critical orbital period, you basically just get the heat is roughly a power law. So these dashed lines is the amount of, of heat deposited in the white dwarf. Uh, at short orbital periods, it can become about a solar luminosity for these models. For higher mass white dwarfs, it can become much larger, like 100 solar luminosities. So the amount of heat deposited in these white dwarfs is much larger than the intrinsic heat coming out of them. So how much does the atmosphere change as, as you're putting all this heat in? That's a good question. That's that's one of the things I've done recently, is actually putting in the heat into a stellar model and seeing what happens. Uh, so to do that, though, you have to understand 
you have to have a handle on where the heat is deposited. And it's going to be roughly where the gravity waves break, but that is dependent on these kind of uncertain nonlinear physics. Uh, now, I said that a wave will tend to break when its, when its wave length or its wave number times its amplitude is roughly equal to one. Uh, and that corresponds also to its horizontal wavelength is roughly equal to its horizontal displacement. For gravity waves, those are approximately the same. Um, now, this will correspond, if you work out the numbers, this actually corresponds to a displacement of roughly the size of the star itself. So it seems kind of unlikely that you could actually get a wave in your star whose, whose amplitude gets too close to the radius of the star itself. That seems like that, that's nonlinear um, and that the wave would break before you got to that kind of amplitude. So there's, it turns out if you write out all the nonlinear terms, there's one term where this criterion uh, seems to be a, uh, the criterion at which waves become strongly nonlinear. So it may actually be that when the horizontal perturbation associated with the gravity wave, which is much larger than the radial perturbation. So when this, when that horizontal perturbation becomes equal to roughly the radial wave number, uh, then the waves may break. And this tends to occur at smaller wave amplitudes, so it occurs deeper in the star. So if this is the criterion that governs the wave breaking. The waves are going to break up in the atmosphere of the white dwarf, and the heat will be able to diffuse outward very quickly. But if this is the wave breaking criterion, uh, then the waves will break deeper in the star, and the heat will tend to get more bottled up, and then it can do some interesting things to the white dwarf. Do you know where that nonlinear term came from? Does it come from a vacuum term? It comes from that advective term, yeah, that convective derivative. Uh, and it's, there's just one term in the radial component of that convective derivative. You hope it doesn't cancel this other one in the term? I, I don't think it does. I mean, I wrote out all the terms. But I, yeah. It's, yeah. In, in many situations, it's not important, but for instance, at the center of a star, this, this isn't going to be important. But for gravity waves in the atmosphere of a star, it should be important. If there's an anisotropy in the dispersion relation, right? It's omega squared is k part squared, and mm -hmm. squared is squared, right? Is that where that term comes from? Uh, it's come from the gravity term. Yeah, it comes from the convective derivatives. I'm just worried about conservation. Yeah, that's, uh, that's a legitimate concern. I don't, I don't think so. I wrote it out the terms. <clears throat> okay, so here's some calculations of, of where we think the, the waves will break as a function of orbital period for some white dwarf models. Uh, we've, uh, I'm expressing where the waves break in terms of this number delta mv. So this is the mass of atmosphere that you have above the breaking point. So if that's a really small number, then the white dwarf, so then the, the waves are breaking high in the atmosphere. If it's a larger number, the waves are breaking deeper in the star. So what we find is that at long orbital periods, the waves break up high up in the atmosphere, but at short orbital periods, the waves uh, break deeper and deeper into the star. Uh, in particular, for a carbon oxygen white dwarf, they tend to break right at this composition gradient, and that's because you have a spike in brew by solid frequency there that promotes wave break. Um, so, and I've used a whole bunch of different breaking criteria here. But, so there's a lot of uncertainty, but we know it's somewhere in the outer layers of the white dwarf. So is this, this is right that thermal time above that is, of course, much longer than, than that period. So you wouldn't see any pulsations on the outside, or would you? So that would be Probably so not. You'd have to, the wave would have to make it all the way to the surface to see pulsations. So. It, yeah. So, so see the line has a little bit fault if you didn't see any effect. The other problem is that even if you did see, even if the white dwarf was pulsating, it'd be at the same frequency as. Well, no, not quite. You said it's slightly pulsating. Well, there's a diff well, no, the frequency within the so in the in the observer's frame, yeah. all these frequencies are two times the orbital frequency, basically. Ah, okay, right. So in the white dwarf frame, so in the white dwarf frame, it's different. Yeah. So yeah, it would be impossible to think involved from just the ellipsoidal deformation. 
Okay, now we also consider a, uh, a two-zone model for, for where the waves break. In this, in this model, we're considering the possibility that there is some differential rotation. So in this model, where it's a very simplified model where the waves propagate into the, the atmosphere of the white dwarf, they break, they spin that layer up such that it becomes synchronized with the orbit. And uh, the core remains subsynchronous, so there's some boundary, uh, there's some critical boundary layer where, where the envelope is viscously transporting some of that angular moment back into the core. So we know this isn't exactly how, how a white dwarf would behave, but it's a good model to get an, an idea of where that strong gradient in rotation might actually occur in a white dwarf and thus where, where a lot of the gravity waves will break and pop their, their heat. So you can actually just calculate what the thickness of that layer is if you parameterize the angular momentum transfer within the star according to some coupling time scale. And you can estimate what that coupling time scale is based on, well, we, we think the most likely way that angular momentum will be transported is through magnetic stress torques. So basically, you can wind up magnetic fields and redistribute angular momentum that way. So that's, that's the two zone model. Uh, so here we've calculated once again that mass of the atmosphere above which we think the gravity waves will break. And you actually get fairly similar numbers to the nonlinear breaking criteria that I showed two slides ago. Once again, it's somewhere around 10 to the minus 6 solar masses, um, depending on the orbital period and, of course, with what kind of white work you have. Um, the bottom line is uh, that the heat tends, we think the heat will get deposited deeper in the star as you move to shorter orbital periods. Okay. So we want to know how a real white dwarf would actually respond to this tidal heat. Um, will the tidal heat just be able to diffuse outwards, or is it going to get bottled up and heat up the white dwarf? So to do that, we uh, run some simulations of white dwarf models using the stellar evolution code MESA. Uh, and we just add in a tidal heating term. So this, we can calculate this heating term as a function of time, and as a function of, of radial coordinate within the white dwarf. Just put in the heat and see how the white dwarf responds. So that's what we do. Uh, here's some examples of, of what we get out. Here I plotted temperature as a function of orbital period. Uh, let's see, we have a lot to look at. There are six panels. The top two are for a 0.6 solar mass white dwarf that starts out at 5,000 degrees. Okay. This is the same white dwarf, starts out at 10,000 degrees, and this one starts out at 15,000. The left side shows the, the nonlinear breaking criterion, uh, the two, two main ones I've talked about. The right side shows that two zone model. Um, and we've also plotted uh, this blue, these blue dot dash lines are the temperature of the white dwarf. If you just took all that tidal heat that's put into it and it immediately radi radiated away without any intrinsic heat. So what you can see is that at large orbital periods, the tidal heat is negligible, right? It's just small, it doesn't do anything. But as you move to smaller orbital periods, it becomes very significant and it dominates uh, the intrinsic luminosity of the white dwarf. So the white dwarf becomes much hotter and much brighter. And depending on, on where the waves break, uh, you'll get different white dwarf temperatures. If the waves tend to break deeper in the star, the white dwarf is cooler, so that would be like this, this dashed red line here, that's for deep wave breaking. Uh, because the heat is basically more bottled up, it can't get out as fast. Uh, the black lines correspond to if the waves break fairly high up in the atmosphere, then the heat is able to diffuse outwards almost immediately. Now you'll notice that many of these tracks end in a star, and the reason that that happens is that uh, you get ignition of, of, you get a thermonuclear runaway in your evolution code. Uh, what we find is that hydrogen starts fusion and it burns faster and faster until it burns actually on a dynamical time scale. 
So we think that basically what happens here is you trigger a, you trigger a tidal nova. You, uh, you heat up the hydrogen layer enough until the fusion becomes self-sustaining and then it burns off in a dynamical time scale. So I, thought, I thought that couldn't happen with the BP cycle only nova explosion. Do they need CNO? There might, yeah. So, so the question of mixing, to give you some CNO, that's another good question. So, and that's that's one that's beyond the scope of my research thus far. Is so, what about the to assume here? So we just this is just from from what we put into Mesa. We find that that's so it's a pure hydrogen atmosphere, very nice. Yes, but but these are just the Mesa results. Mesa can't do a, a, an actual thermal nuclear runaway, or at least you have to allow for some some mass to leave your system. If we have we haven't examined that process fully. Mesa became unstable, at least. That's what Mesa became unstable, and and the the burning rate goes up to like 10 to the 6 solar luminosities. Really PP cycle. Uh, I think it was PP cycle. Yeah. So there's this possibility that the tides can trigger a, a, a nova without any mass transfer actually occurring. So you can see that just from uh, the temperature evolution of the white board. Here I've just plotted temperature basically as a function of that of the mass in the white board. So uh, you know, the surface of the white board, the temperature is low, and here at 45 minutes, tidal heat has basically done nothing to the temperature profile of the white board. But as you move to shorter orbital periods, of course, the temperature becomes larger. You actually get a, a peak in temperature somewhere around this helium hydrogen composition gradients, and if that peak in temperature reaches about 10 to the 7 Kelvin, you can ignite one of these 10 on the Okay, we also would like to compare these results to observations, so we at least have you know, some dignity left. We want to be able to not be just completely making stuff up. Uh, and one of the systems that allows us to do that is the recently discovered system SDSSJ0651. This is a detached binary white dwarf system with an orbital period of 12.75 minutes. And uh, there's no mass transfer going on, so it's, it's a much cleaner system than ones where there's mass transfer that's you know, also transporting angular momentum because of heating and x-rays and all that sort of thing. It's detached, so it's the ideal system if, uh, that we can study tides in. Uh, and in particular, the more massive white dwarf in that system, which has a mass of about 0.5 solar masses, uh, has a surface temperature of roughly 9,000 degrees. And here it plotted it against some of our temperature evolution tracks for a white dwarf at that orbital period with a similar mass companion. And what you see is that most of our tracks actually predict temperatures that are larger than the observed surface temperature. So that would imply one of two things. Either the, temp either the tidal heat is being deposited fairly deeply in the white dwarf, so that would be uh, well modeled by this red curve. So that's, that's, within, that's within a parameter space that we think is reasonable. So that's one possibility. The other possibility is that the amount of tidal heat deposited in the white dwarf is smaller than we've predicted. And that would actually mean that the white dwarf is more synchronized than we predicted. Because if it's more synchronized, then less of that tidal energy is going to be put into it as heat. Yeah, or it's not synchronized. Right? Or it's not synchronized at all, but we really, for something this short of an orbital period, we think it, it basically has to be. Sorry, what's T coup? Hmm? What's T coup? Coup is that? Coupling time. Oh, see, this is the coupling time. So this is. Uh, this is, this is for uh, that two-zone model. Uh, so these are coupling times at which angular momentum is transported between the core and envelope. So this doesn't necessarily mean it was deposited, the heat was deposited deeper in the core. It could mean that the coupling was less efficient. Yeah, so for less efficient coupling, that moves that boundary between your synchronized envelope and your asynchronous core to, to larger depths. And if you really had a, a synchronous envelope and a non-synchronous core, all the waves would break right at that boundary. So that's where the heat would be deposited. So less efficient coupling would correspond to heat at larger depths, which is this red dash. But there will also be heat deposited due to the 
continuing desynchronization of the bulk of the wave. Yeah, so there's viscous heat. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And if that's happening on a time scale T couple, yeah. which is a reasonable assumption. Yeah. It's magnetic couple. And uh, what does that do to the structure? So I mean that's one of the things that we look at in the Mesa cell evolution. And basically it's subdominant. It's order. basically, yeah, it's a small effect because <coughs> for the most part the white dwarf is degenerate, putting in some extra energy doesn't do much to the pressure, it doesn't change your model very much. Uh, it, the atmosphere, at the high up in the atmosphere, it's not degenerate anymore. So it inflates a little bit, but it's small. We find it's very small. And what happens if you have no hydrogen layer? If you have no, that's a good question. Uh, we, haven't, we haven't done tidal theories for every possible white dwarf we can make. I mean, there's also, you can make white dwarfs that are pure helium and that are just 0 0.05 solar masses, you can make white dwarfs with really thick hydrogen layers. Or make helium CO. Right, you can have just a CO core and just a helium layer and a hydrogen layer. Uh, without this composition gradient for a CO white dwarf, probably the waves would break high up in the helium atmosphere. And in that case, uh, you might be more likely to get one of these tracks. Maybe that's evidence that there is a hydrogen light on this right world, but there's a lot of other uncertainties. Do you measure temperature for those components or just one? Yeah, so the other component in this system, the other component you'd expect to be more tidally heated because it's lower mass and it's larger. Um, but that component uh, turns out to be like 16,000 degrees, I think. Uh, and most of our temperature tracks for that white dwarf go roughly through 16,000 degrees or maybe, maybe a little below it. So with that white dwarf, it's really hard to know what's intrinsic heat. Like, is it just a young white dwarf? Or... It's actually measured. Yeah, so the temperature of that other white dwarf, it's 0.25 solar masses, has a measure, measure temperature of 16,000 something. That dominates everything. And, and yeah. the luminosity ratio is consistent with the tidal heat ratio? So we'd expect that uh, the amount of tidal heat put into each white dwarf, even though they're different sizes, is roughly the same, weirdly enough. And that's because uh, the, this, this mechanism of generating gravity waves is less efficient in human dwarfs. Uh, so the lack of the edge. Yeah, it's because the brute by solid frequency is larger in helium white dwarfs because they're less degenerate. And so the wavelength of gravity waves is, uh, is correspondingly smaller, so it's harder for the tidal potential to couple with, with the gravity waves. So that means that actually the, the helium poor white dwarfs, even though they're bigger, you'd expect tidal effects to become important at much larger orbital periods, but we find that's not the case. But it's hotter. It's hotter. So it's much, I think much most likely it means it's younger in the system because most of these low mass helium white dwarfs that they found are, are hot and young. That's purely a selection effect. They look for of blue, course it is. blue uh, it is. objects. So. <laughs> it is, but there's no reason yeah. to think. Yeah. It's really hard to know if the hot, the observed hot temperature of the white dwarf in this system is due to tidal heat or. It could be, I guess. It could be due to tidal heat, yes. Right. It could be. Because it's, it has to be very young. Yeah, uh, that sounds unreasonable. Yeah, it's 10 to 8. Yeah, but all the ones they found are unreasonably young. No, the most, most of them are more like 10,000, where you can stay with nuclear burning very easily, but 16,000 is hard. Okay. So it's not would be nice. So it, it could be tidal heat. Uh, it could also be intrinsic heat. But for this, for the more massive white dwarf, what I'm saying is that even if you make the white dwarf really cold, like four or 5,000 degrees, most of our temperature tracks lie above the observed temperature. So what you're seeing, we think, is definitely tidal heat, probably. Because if you start the white dwarf hotter, then all these tracks are also going to move up, including this one. So we find it hard to explain the low surface temperature unless it's due to tidal heat. And it's old. And it's old. And the tidal heat is deposited fairly deep. So that's, that's, that's a real result. I mean, it's, there's definitely a real thing to compare theory to. That's very interesting.
Okay. Uh, now, even though there are some, you know, some observation results that we can start to test our theories with, there are a lot of uncertainties. How how is rotation going to affect the waves? You know, we've neglected the Coriolis force that changes uh, the wave character. So it'd be good to to try to incorporate rotational effects into the wave excitation. Uh, understand, of course, how the waves break, where they, where their heat is deposited, how angular momentum is redistributed throughout the star. Uh, these are kind of nasty problems, but uh, people are doing good work on it, and uh, hopefully we can make some progress soon. Um, and finally, it'd be great to apply these systems, these calculations to systems undergoing mass transfer, because right now, it's basically, it's not well known if you have two white dwarfs, whether the mass transfer is going to be stable or unstable once once you reach Roche overflow. That depends on how strong uh, the tidal the tidal effects are. So we like to give some constraints on, on the mass ratios that give you unstable mass transfer. Um, okay, how much time do I have left? About ten minutes. Yeah, four questions. Okay. Uh, so in my, in my last 10 minutes, I'm going to talk about some other work I've done recently, uh, which is on tides in triple star systems. So this is a, this is a Kepler light curve. Has anybody seen this light curve before? Can anybody guess what it is? Well, I'll give you a pretty big hint. I said I'm talking about 30 body tides. So it's a triple star system. Uh, in particular, it's a triply eclipsing star, star system. So all these little things are eclipses. You can see that some of these are a little deeper than others. So this is when one star gets eclipsed. This is when the other star gets eclipsed. So this is a binary star that rotates in orbits in 0.9 days. Okay. But then there's also these big, deep, broad eclipses that happen every 22 and a half days. And that's due to uh, eclipses of the third star, which is a red giant. So this star is composed of two like 0.8 solar mass dwarf stars that orbit each other every 0.9 days, which in turn orbits the red giant every 45 days. And everything's eclipsing everything else. Is that a flare? Yeah, that yeah this is, I think that's a flare. Yeah. Uh, there is evidence of magnetic activity, as there often is, in very tight binaries. Um, <clears throat> now, another thing you'll notice is that if you look at panels C and E here, these are uh, these are eclipses of the dwarf stars. So this is when the dwarf stars are behind the red giant. You're not getting any light from them, but you still get modulation at roughly their orbital period. You see that? And if you take a Fourier transform of the light curve, you see in fact, that there are some frequencies at, at basically at twice their orbital frequency and also at some other harmonics. And so that's an indication that there's some sort of tidal effect within the red giant due to the orbital motion of the dwarf stars around each other. Uh, turns out there's also a, a pretty high mass red giant, it's about three solar masses. It's probably on the horizontal branch, has a radius of 12 solar radii. Yeah, two dwarf stars. No horizontal branch for three solar masses. Well, it's it's in the helium core burning phase. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's basically yeah. The, that's a clump star, whatever you want to call it. <clears throat> okay, those are the orbital periods, which I already said. Okay, so uh, to get an idea of, of what the tidal effects will do in this kind of system, I want you to imagine shifting into a, a reference frame where that's spinning at the, at the orbital motion of the center mass of the dwarf stars around the red giant. So in this, uh, in this reference frame, you would just see the center mass of these two stars is not changing, but these two stars are orbiting around each other. And the dominant tidal force is that the red giant wants to have its bulge pointing towards that center mass. That's the typical two-body tidal effect. And that's seen in this system, and it's, it's synchronized to the red giant with that orbital motion in the system. Okay. But there are some other ways uh, that the red giant can respond. One is it can pulse like that, 
such that every time these stars are aligned, the red giant is either at a maximum or minimum size. This actually isn't a radial pulsation. It's, uh, it's coming out, it's squashing up and down out of the, out of the whiteboard, okay? So if we're looking at it from the top, it looks like it's getting bigger and smaller. So this is an M equals zero non-radial perturbation, okay? Another way the red giant can respond. What, uh, what's the amplitude in practice of uh, the perturbation? I mean, is it really the amplitude in this system? Yeah, and how do they, how do they see so it? So in this system, you can observe it. You just take an FFT of the light curve. You can basically just observe. So delta radius over radius would be? Uh, so the delta luminosity is something like, what is it, 10 to the minus 4, roughly? But they can see that with Kepler. Yeah. So this might be slightly exaggerated. <laughs> this is a little bit <laughs> yeah. Good eye. Uh, OK, you also notice that, um, so I put in, this is the, the tidal forcing frequency of, uh, in the red giant, in this rotating frame, it's this. But in the observer's frame, it's this. So for this perturbation, uh, those, those frequencies are the same as at n equals zero. So an observer will see a pulsation at this frequency. Two times this orbital frequency minus two times the, the long orbital frequency. Okay. The other way that the red giant can respond is like that. I call this the prograde mode because the bulge is rotating in the same sense as the orbital motion stars. Okay, uh, and this one, all these modes have the same frequency in the red giant's frame, but uh, in the observer's frame, you see a, a modulation at exactly two times this orbital frequency. Okay, and then the last simple way is a retrograde, and equals two perturbation like that. And that is going to have uh, an observed frequency of two times the high orbital frequency minus four times the small orbital frequency. And it turns out this is the dominant perturbation. This is the, this is the largest amplitude observed in this system. And if you write out all the tidal forcing terms, so that the dominant one, of course, like I said, is just this one. Never mind. The dominant one is the normal <laughs> one, the two-body tidal effect. Uh, these three-body tidal effects, they have a very, the tidal forcing is very weak. Uh, it turns out the tidal forcing due to this retrograde mode is the strongest. That one is the strongest. Okay. Uh, almost done here. This is just a plot of all the oscillation modes for, uh, for a red giant model. There's a lot of them because uh, these modes have very high radial number. They're basically they're mixed modes. All these modes up here, these are mixed modes. They have a lot of nodes in the core of the red giant. Uh, but these ones right at the spikes, these are basically P modes that propagate in the convective, uh, the large convective envelope of the star. So these are the, the traditional P modes. And you can see that at these large forcing frequencies, because you can get very large forcing frequencies because of the hierarchical nature of the system. And that allows the tides to couple with these P modes uh, instead of just the G modes. So these G modes have very small surface amplitudes, that's what's plotted here, and they have very small overlap integrals with the tidal potential. They're very hard to just force. But the P modes have large overlap integrals and large amplitudes. So that means the, uh, the observed effect of one of these modes is going to be much larger than it would be for a G mode. And because of the high forcing frequency, you can couple those modes well. So that normally these modes you wouldn't be able to observe, uh, but because, because the tidal forcing frequency couples with them very well, the tidal forcing couples with them well, you actually get a fairly large uh, luminosity perturbation. So these are the observed luminosity perturbations as a function of the radius. Um, here I've just used the radius as kind of a, a parameter to kind of 
lump into a bunch of uncertainties into the stellar model. I've put it into this radius of the star. And this is a predicted luminosity variations uh, from my calculations, these curves here. And what you see is basically the predicted luminosity variations are, are roughly the same order of magnitude to what's actually observed. So all or, three are observed? Mm -hmm. the red lines? The yeah, so the red lines are observed. Okay. So they are all this one isn't very believable because okay. this is at the eclipsing frequencies of the dwarf star, so it's contaminated. But these two should be pretty good. Uh, and so roughly for a, for a radius of about 12.5, you get pretty good agreement. It's not perfect, so there's, there's a little bit of a mystery there. But roughly, we know what's causing those oscillations. It's this new three-body tidal effect. Uh, that's pretty cool. Uh, and real quickly, this three-body tidal effect may be able to cause uh, orbital decay in, in the right situations. Uh, so what I've plotted here is the orbital decay time scale due to this three-body tidal effect uh, as a function of I'm just letting the star evolve. So I'm calculating this time scale for lots of different stellar models. I've also included this orbit this decay. So yeah, the main orbital decay that you're going to get is the inner orbit. So those two little those two little dwarf stars, their orbit's going to decay. That's the main orbital effect you get out of it. Uh, you can also, you know, estimate the magnetic breaking orbital decay rate and gravitational waves. Uh, and at most times, this orbital decay rate due to the three body tides is very long. It's greater than the age of the universe. It can be ignored. Each one of these little dips is a resonance, which actually doesn't do much. Uh, but turns out when the star is descending the red giant branch, it's becoming a helium core burning star. The star is shrinking, and that actually may be able to put you into a resonance locking phase where the orbital frequency of the two little stars decays just exactly right so that uh, it decays basically at the same rate that the star shrinks. So as the star shrinks, it kind of drags the two little stars together. Uh, I don't have time to explain all the dynamics of resonance locking, but it could cause substantial orbital decay, and it may be why those two stars have such a small observed orbital period today. Okay, that's all I have. Thank you. Uh, any other questions for you? Sorry, I'm picking on this again um, about the breaking condition. Yeah. So I think of ocean waves. So mm -hmm. maybe I'm missing ocean wave wrong, but ocean waves right on horizontal wavelengths. Well, I mean, the horizontal movement is much bigger than the vertical movement once it gets close to shore. But it breaks not when the horizontal displacement equals to the, sorry, equals to the radio, excuse me, equals to the dash. It's when the vertical displacement equals the dash. Hmm. Right. It breaks when it, that's true. it <laughs> right. breaks when the ocean is only like a few meters that deep. It doesn't break when the ocean is kilometer deep. Right. So but the dispersion relation is different, right, for shallow water waves. It, it doesn't matter. Dispersion no. only is the linearity. The major linearity term, right? So I don't understand why is it that. Um, so I imagine ocean waves very similar to the the red wave. It's actually shallow water too. Well, well there is one major difference. Me, it's not shallow water, it's deep water, but, uh, but it's very anisotropic. Yeah. Most of the movements in the horizontal direction. But you can't have ocean waves. You never have ocean waves whose horizontal wavelength is the size of the Earth. You could. It's called a tsunami. Oh, sorry. Well, <laughs> but, and, and they break on the coast, not before. <laughs> that people know that. <laughs> Sorry, their horizontal movement is not the size of the Earth, that's what I meant. So, the displacement. Of the, See, yeah, the, yeah, the yeah. horizontal displacement is never the size of the Earth. No, right. And that's, that's what you'd have to get. That's, that's the displacements you'd have to get to for gravity waves to break under the standard unlinear yeah. breaking criteria. That's right. And that, uh, to me, that seems unlikely. That but it can, just seems to me that ocean wave breaks when they satisfy KR, Kassai R equals 1. Right. When the vertical height right. of the ocean equals 
So anyway, so that, that's what I didn't understand the differences of the two. Maybe there's some intrinsic differences. I, I agree there's some uncertainty. I don't completely understand. But imagine in that scenario, how would you change your picture? If oh, if the way it's framed according to the normal. way at the surface, yeah. So I mean, so that's the black curves that I plotted. That's what was going on. I was using that normal breaking criteria, and then yeah, yeah the brave, the waves tend to break during the surface of the star, and the tidal heat escapes very quickly. So it doesn't do much to the structure. It doesn't do much, yeah. So that's understandable. Yeah. The angle momentum in that case. Presumably, it gets redistributed throughout the star, but the time scale which that happens is unknown because it has to do with this unknown viscous process. So you see Can you ever get to a stage where the where the, the envelope is spinning faster? So or is no. it simply impossible? If you it ever get to right? <laughs> as soon as you spin up the envelope to being synchronous right. with the orbit, then mm -hmm. the frequency of the incoming waves becomes zero in the wave. Right. So, so they just break so they, they deeper break, and deeper until they break at that point. And that's what the two zone model is. That's, that's exactly what it is. Okay. Yep. Yep. Um, can you use your three body model to So the problem is that this three-body tidal effect is only important for very close hierarchical triples. So this very compact ones. So this one, all three stars were within an orbital period of like 40 days. So there's very few systems that are that compact um, in the field. It's true. It, yeah, in the clusters. Of and you also need the primary star needs to be pretty big. In this system, it's a red giant that allows the tidal effect to be much larger. If it was if it was a main sequence star, that three-body tidal effect would be negligible. So, yeah, unfortunately, systems like that are pretty rare. But in the when you do get them, that three-body tidal effect could be pretty important. Could also help you find those systems because it's going to give you a pulsation out of it at a combination frequency that you wouldn't otherwise expect. It might let you pick it out of data that you wouldn't otherwise see. But this one was only found because of the eclipse of the red giant, I guess, right? Most yeah, this Kepler one was found because it was a triply eclipsing system in the Kepler field. Right. But if you just, other systems like this might just look like a red giant that pulsates, and uh, those those pulsations have 10 minus 4 delta L over L except for Kepler. Except for Kepler. But that won't always be. Just for so, a while. <laughs> maybe they've seen a comment on this too, but if these pulsations, I thought they could couple to sort of daughter modes and excite other modes, they also get high up. So I'm still, still thinking of observational consequence. So you said the pulsations at the forcing frequency you can't see because they're the same anyway, but right. should there be pulsations at, at different frequencies which are, which are basically uh, triggered right. by this right. rather large amplitude. Yeah, it's possible you could get nonlinear daughter modes whose frequencies add up to that. Right. to that force and frequency. And if you saw that, that would be a great, yeah, that would be a great observation. It would help us understand nonlinear processes and how tides work in these systems. You don't generically expect that. I mean, that's, I, I'm looking for a prediction. I don't, um, I don't have the observation. Well, the problem is, in order to have that three by, that, you know, three mode interaction, you need to have standing modes. You can't have traveling waves. So you, they can't be extremely nonlinear. So it's only going to happen at larger orbital periods. Uh, it it might it might happen for say a system like like a two hour orbital period. It's possible that it has to be in the resonance of the resonance. Um, not necessarily. Yeah, because you're talking about the resonance of the resonance. Yeah, yeah. 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 continue this discussion about PFCs and we'll take uh, Jim for the night uh, send email.